Thinking Aloud, conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with parapsychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we'll be exploring precognitive dreaming. My guest is Professor Paul Callis. He is the author of The Oneironauts, Using Dreams to Engineer Our Future. He is also a professor of astronomy at the University of California, Berkeley. He's known for his discoveries of debris, disks around stars, and he also led a team of scientists to obtain the first visible light images of an extrasolar planet, and that was around the star Fomalhaut, a distance of 25 light years away from our sun. And now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Paul. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you very much, Jeff. You discovered as a child that some of your dreams were precognitive, and you've been basically, best I can tell, uh, recording your dreams and observing them, studying them ever since that time. Yeah, just like many people actually. Uh, the age of onset for having your first precognitive dream is typically in late elementary school or middle school, uh, in your preteen years. And that's when I had my first precognitive dream. Uh, I think many people who have had that type of dream remember their first time, so to speak. And it actually was an, something astonishing and unpredictable that happened in school. Let's hear the story. It's, it's a wonderful, a very unique dream. Well, yeah, it's, uh, it, it was really, this actually has to do with audio, um, um, the language, uh, precognitive dream, where you're puzzled about language, not visual. So a lot of times you think of precognitive dreams as deja vu, which means previously seen. In this case, it's more about previously heard. So in the dream, it's uh, actually just a few moments before I wake up. So I do remember the dream very carefully or very clearly, crystal clear, actually, because I wake up and I'm puzzled about what I just dreamt. And I dream about a boy who uh, has injured uh, his knee and somebody asks him, well, how did you get that? And the boy says, jumping from a hay cart to a 16 wheeler. And that's the dream. And just like many other dreams, you might spend the morning thinking, well, that was weird. Who says that? What does that mean? I've never heard that before. What does that mean? So I was actually that the memory of the dream was very clear and was very specific and had a specific sequence of words that you don't hear. I've done a Google search and that phrase doesn't exist. Well, about a few months later, I'm in my gym class and a boy walks in and he's injured his knee. He's got some scabs and scratches. And a girl in my class asked him, well, how did you get that? And, you know, he says, jumping from a hay cart to a 16 wheeler. And I remembered my dream instantly. And the, it's such an unusual phrase. It's like a password, a unique connect, a unique sequence of words that is hard to guess. Uh, and of course I thought, wow, I just had that as a dream a few months ago. And I remember being puzzled about it. And so since then, uh, I started keeping track of my precognitive dreams, uh, always wary that they could be illusions of the mind. We make mistakes all the time. Our memories are flawed. Our memories are always reconstructions. They're not like uh, video cameras exactly. They're more like artistic works. So I've been cautious about these uh, precognitive dreams until much later in life I said, finally, I have enough evidence that I think it's a real phenomena. It's not an illusion of the mind. 
It's fascinating that uh, you pursued a career in astronomy because uh, astronomers, uh, I think sometimes you, you see very unique events like a supernova explosion or something is relatively rare. And then you have to ponder it and, and study it. It's hard to do controlled experiments, but you're still able to approach the subject scientifically. And I gather that you really used the scientific method is as you practice it in astronomy to uh, understand the nature of dreaming and precognitive dreams in particular. Yes, of course. Uh, first of all, um, there is a problem with precognitive dreams, and that is that you are perceiving events that don't exist yet. So that's logically impossible. You cannot perceive something that doesn't exist. So you have to look for simpler explanations. Uh, by Occam's razor, something that we use all the time in science, uh, you're always looking for the simplest explanation. And if something is too convoluted or complicated, you're probably going down the wrong path. So the simpler explanations, uh, such as uh, uh, flawed memories, some people have... Um, Deja vu or pre, the feeling of having precognition because they have temporal lobe epilepsy. And that's well documented in the medical literature. Um, but I don't have temporal lobe epilepsy. And uh, in this case, with the so-called hay cart dream, jumping from a hay cart to a 16-wheeler, that was a unique sequence of words. It wasn't like a vague memory of hearing something similar to something else. Uh, so, with this sort of process of exclusion, excluding all the other simpler explanations, I concluded the Heckart dream was most likely a precognitive dream. And then I had another precognitive dream. And then I go through the process of elimination. What are the simpler explanations, the ones that make more sense, the ones that we actually have physical explanations for? And then after excluding everything else, say, well, that was a precognitive dream too. And then in my book, uh, I actually finally wrote it up. I have 332 precognitive dreams that I studied, including an astronomical discovery that I made, which was very well documented in a dream journal and subsequently in the press, in the, the public domain. So you can actually compare what I dreamt to what actually happened in the history of science. And like you said, Astronomy is kind of cool because we find things that do not exist in, uh, in the scientific literature. They're not even part of human knowledge until some phenomena shows up in the sky. And all of a sudden, we've learned something new about the universe. Uh, and many of these phenomena have never been predicted before. And so they, you can't even anticipate them. They just happen. And all of a sudden, a new cottage industry of science is born. With regard to the many precognitive dreams that you have documented, I gather that uh, it was very hard to know in advance that this was going to be a precognitive dream. It's sort of only after the fact that uh, you've been able to uh, analyze it and determine that that was the case. Yes, this is a every most people have this similar experience. You realize events as they're happening were a dream. You couldn't have anticipated it. Uh, and as events are happening, all of a sudden you remember, you recall, oh, I had a dream about that. And uh, so this is one of the, the problems with precognitive dreams, the way we experience them now. They're sort of useless for predicting the future, ironically. You know, a precognitive dream holds great promise that you might do something right in your life versus something wrong, that you might save somebody uh, from injury or death, that you might plan, uh, for example, find a vaccine for the COVID-19 virus. That would be nice if we could have precognitive dreams among doctors so they could say, well, well you know, in the future, this is going to be the vaccine. But that's not what's happening. And that's because every one of us is sort of individually having their own precognitive dreams and dismissing them sometimes, but then other times believing in them. But we almost never are able to, in advance, use a precognitive dream to change our life path. But it does happen. 
So I would say in my life, once every 10 years, I've been able to do something where a precognitive dream influenced me, influenced my decisions in two ways. A precognitive dream can, of course, help you prevent a unpleasant experience, something that you do not wish to happen. A precognitive dream can also help you affirm something that you wish to happen. You realize as events are happening that if you were to do something different, you would get something more. You would accomplish something that's desirable. So usually precognitive dreams are all about, oh, let's use them to avoid disaster. But also uh, they are used, they can be used to have an intuition about what decisions will benefit you most. And that's very important. Uh, and people individually are using precognitive dreams like this. And my hope is that in the future, uh, we can actually get a little bit more organized and use them to have some predictive power to actually be useful uh, uh, more uh, pr uh, uh, more often. Well, in your book, The Oneironauts, you really are suggesting that we could train a, a, a group of people or really have a program comparable to the astronaut program where uh, trained scientists working with their dreams would be able to get more of a handle on, on this question of precognitive dreams and what we could do about it. That's right. Even without any advance in science or technology, I, my suggestion was if uh, just a normal person, they don't have to be a scientist or anything. If you could have a, a, a group of 10 or 100 or even 10,000 people, and that's all feasible, to have a common experience in the future that has a goal that's important for some reason. Uh, among the many dreams that these 10,000 people will have, they will have a common experience and using uh, just collecting a lot of data and sifting through the data and analyzing the data, you would be able to separate the, the large portion of dreams that are personal, in, um, all about the imagination, and the tiny fraction, the few seconds of information that are actually from the future that will be shared among those 10,000 dreamers. Or just make it 100. I bet it could work. Well, let's talk about uh, the dream that you had, which preceded probably the scientific discovery that you are most identified with, the discovery of a, a ring of debris surrounding the star Fomalhaut. My expertise in astronomy is searching for and characterizing extrasolar planetary systems. So it's essentially solar systems, except around other stars. And that's rather difficult, actually. It's technologically demanding. And uh, the results uh, have been surprising many times in this domain. So uh, in, in my case, I discovered something called Fomalhaut B. And it actually has an official name called Dagon. Uh, and Fomalhaut is um, uh, a star in the sky, which you can see with the naked eye. And using the Hubble Space Telescope, I discovered a ring of cometary dust around Fomalhaut. And that happened in 2004, and I kept studying Fomalhaut, and in 2008 I published the discovery of uh, Fomalhaut B in Journal of Science. And uh, I remembered in 2008 that something about the discovery was familiar, that I had a dream so at some point in the past, I couldn't even remember when, uh, that so had something to do with foam, a, a dust ring around a star. So I searched my dream journals uh, because I was keeping uh, dream journals off and on uh, for since, since the Haycart dream. And lo and behold, I had sketched... Uh, a long time ago, the discovery that I would make with the Hubble Space Telescope. And it was so long ago that such a discovery did not exist in human knowledge. And even the theory that such a thing could be seen didn't exist for another three years after my dream. So a scientist can anticipate 
discoveries using existing knowledge. In fact, that's the wonderful thing about sleep and dreaming. In dreaming, you piece together fragments of information and you come up with ideas, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're precognitive. They're basically really good thinking while you're asleep. Uh, but in this case, with Fomalhaut's Comet Belt, there's just no way uh, when I had the dream that I would have been able to anticipate what I actually saw with the Hubble Space Telescope. And uh, I'm going to show some of those images on, on the screen so that our viewers have uh, some idea of what we're talking about. It, it was a yeah, very specific type of uh, uh, ring or elliptical orbit around the star. And as I recall, uh, the star was offset. It wasn't centered uh, in the orbit. It was off to one side. And that appeared in your dream as well. That's exactly right. Very, that's a perfect summary. The, you'd expect um, a comet belts to actually be a circle around a star and with a star in the middle. That's what a typical orbit looks like. But in this case, the whole comet belt was shifted away from where the star was. The star was no longer at the center. And this was the discovery that was published in Nature uh, in 2005. And that was exact. what I sketched in my dream journal was the same offset. And in my book, I actually showed when I was making the discovery, what I actually saw for the first time when I was at home looking at the Hubble Space Telescope data. You know, we, we, we download the data from the Hubble Space Telescope and we work on it on our computers, wherever we may be, in our office or at home. And when I made the discovery, I saw this offset. And I informed my co-investigators, uh, Mark Clampin and James Graham. And so there's an email record of my the discovery with the snapshots that I sent them. And if you look at those snapshots, those attachments, they match what I sketched in a dream journal earlier. So uh, it was a really good example, like very, in a way, fortunate that all of this is recorded by email and dream journals and even in the journal Nature. Now, as I recall, your dream took place in 1995. So it was uh, about a decade in advance of, of the actual discovery. Uh, and the dream did occur at a time when you were still very interested in, in studying uh, the you know, debris that uh, might exist around a star. That's right. And so I go through what existing knowledge uh, was like back then. So I have a long chapter in my book, which is a sort of a tedious and detailed process of elimination. Could I have been guessing of this comet belt? And I showed that back in 1995, there was one comet belt that I was studying intensely. And it sort of looks like it's a very linear feature. It doesn't look like a belt. It doesn't look like a ring. It sort of looks like two flames shooting out from a star. That's sort of the shape two flames. And that was the only such disk that you could see in the astronomical literature. Um, Fomalhaut's ring would be inferred and uh, a, a little bit later, in 1998, would be the first time we would sort of see Fomalhaut's ring uh, through astronomical observations. But the dream happened in 1995. I might just mention parenthetically that I yeah, did a little research of my own on Fomalhaut and discovered that since we're doing this interview here in October, it's normally a star seen in the southern hemisphere. But in October, uh, around this time of year, it can be seen in the northern hemisphere. So I went out and took a look at it last night. It's a beautiful star. Good job. It's really low from um, northern yeah. hemisphere. It's uh, almost on the horizon uh, but definitely you can find it and it's a naked eye star. You can see it. Um, and it's rather famous. It's, uh, uh, historically, it's a star that has been mentioned among many cultures and has significance. 
As an astronomer, I would think that you have a unique appreciation of the possibilities of precognition because the very nature of time, as I understand it, is uh, important in Einstein's special and general theories of relativity. And uh, time becomes uh, a factor that astronomers have to deal with all the time. Yeah, that's right. In indeed, uh, astronomy is the study of space and time on very grand scales, on the largest scales. And uh, it's amazing what we can infer about events that, uh, for example, the beginning of the universe. How can you know anything about the beginning of the universe uh, by just looking up at the sky? And we have, and that's exactly what's happened. And I think the appreciation I have in us as an astronomer is that, especially with new discoveries, they're not very much unlike precognitive dreams. They're similar. All new discoveries in nature are puzzling. You don't have answers right away. You don't know why it happened. All of that will come later. What is most important is to make your measurements and to be correct about your measurements. And explanations can come later. And that's what I was trying to do with my book. I'm saying, well, this is what I observed. I am an observer. I'm not a theorist. Uh, I, I'm, I don't have an explanation for precognitive dreams, even theoretically. I just know the phenomena has been observed and I've documented it the, I've documented it the best I could. I, and, and I published my data the best I could. And so that's part of the whole scientific process. Uh, as a scientist, I did the best I could from the things I know as a scientist. Now, I gather that uh, at the time you did all of this work, studying your dreams and uh, engaging in your a career in astronomy, you were not particularly focused on the literature of uh, precognition within the fields of parapsychology and psychical research. Indeed, uh, there, I was not. Um, I had quite a lot of uh, work to do in astronomy. And what's amazed me is while I was writing the book, it took 10 years to write the book. Uh, quite a lot of research has appeared in the literature. People are interested in precognitive dreams. They are uh, scientists too. Uh, har uh, scientists who are professors at universities. I would say that roughly one out of three professors at universities that I meet uh, show an interest and have some response. Uh, not, not necessarily skeptical, but inquisitive. Uh, so I think um, the research uh, will actually improve. And I'm, you know, in my lifetime, I'd like to see if, the, if as far as precognitive dreams go, if the trend will be towards increasing skepticism or increasing validation. We have a lot of data on uh, precognition, not just from dreams, but from uh, all sorts of other experimental protocols. And, and we also have a lot of data specifically with regard to dreams. And, and for example, telepathy in dreams has, has been researched quite a bit. So I, I would think that uh, one of the uh, – areas and methodology and parapsychology that seems consistent with your approach is, is the notion of consensus. If, if you have multiple people who are uh, looking at the same target uh, and, and they come up with similar responses, you can do very careful analysis to find out exactly uh, where the consensus exists and that might give you higher confidence. Yes, that's right. And I wish um, actually the samples would increase in size. Um, so a lot of times the, these experiments are something like 20 or 30 people, maybe just eight or something. But using, uh, you know, technology and social media even, uh, and people have tried this a bit, uh, get 100,000 people to participate. 100,000 people. Tell them, for example, the only news source that you will ever read for the next six months is the BBC, front headlines. So you're not searching. So here we're trying to avoid the self-fulfilling prophecy where you have, let's say you have a dream of an airplane crash uh, in a field uh, uh, in the Midwest somewhere. You may start searching everywhere so that you end up affirming your dream. 
And then you make, you say, ah, precognitive dream. It showed up in, in the newspaper, the local newspaper here. Uh, but in fact, that's a self-fulfilling prophecy. That's a mistake. Uh, so you could do something more controlled. Let's say you, you have a hundred thousand people where they only look at the headlines of the BBC and whatever is the major headline there is something that they may all have in common as a dream. And you can show it, uh, you can, because the sample size is larger, uh, you may be able to show statistically that this was a significant effect. And that's what people are already trying to do. I'm just hoping that it improves. Well, I uh, remember back in, in the day you know, when I first started out on, on radio in the 1970s at KPFA, we set up a uh, precognition registration bureau where people could report their dreams and ostensible precognitions. And I, I collected hundreds of, of examples. And at, at that time, we didn't find any that matched actual events. So it's, it, yeah, it's not an easy thing to do. It's not easy. So back then, you didn't have what we have right now. You have, you can have these reports, which are, you know, are spoken language or written language. And uh, you basically have software that analyzes the content of what is said among these thousands of dreams and sort of picking out common words or recurring words or recurring uh, meanings. Uh, so, you know, you can now deal with data on a scale that's orders of magnitude greater than what you had back then. You have a very interesting chapter at the end of your book where you look at what a, a future scenario, just focusing in, as I recall, on one person where the computer would have all kinds of data regarding all the normal <laughs> inputs into your uh, psyche so that if you have a dream that cannot be accounted for by the residue of the day, the computer would automatically uh, flag that. Yeah, that's, that's right. Indeed. The so-called dream net. I, I made up that word. The dream net is uh, analogous to the internet. The internet is a vast repository of information, but the dream net would also, uh, process the information. It would be searching for information, just like the internet now is also searching for your likes and your needs as a consumer and finding out who you are, how old you are, and what you might be interested in, and uh, targeting you with certain ads. So the internet is computing also based on data. The dream net would just be taking in the, the dreams of whoever's participating and searching for things that could occur uh, in the future. Uh, for example, let's say you have a bunch of people and uh, in the future, uh, a bunch of people are traveling uh, from Denver to New York City. And all of a sudden, this group of people who are going to be at the airport, Denver's airport, on February 12th, are having nightmares about travel delays. They are have an elevated, um, an elevated uh, stress level in their dreams. And because the DreamNet also knows everybody's travel reservations, it discovers that this group of people who are having elevated travel stress dreams will all be at Denver on February 12th. So you could possibly say there's a chance, a high chance, that Denver's airport is going to be closed due to a snowstorm. So you're... Uh, you're doing that weather forecasting and that sort of uh, stress forecasting months before anybody even knows there's going to be a snowstorm in Denver. It reminds me of a study that, as I recall, was done uh, in the United Kingdom many years ago where there was a a mining disaster, a, a collapse of a coal mine in the village of Aberfan, I believe it was. And uh, researchers came in after the fact and discovered that many of the people in this village, uh, I think the mine uh, collapsed on top of a school. It was a terrible disaster. But, but they discovered that many of the villagers there had had dreams about that event in advance. Yeah, I know about that case, and that's that's a good case to to think about. 
Is it possible that uh, people anticipate these types of disasters? So, for example, if you live near a hillside, I may be concerned about uh, landslides when during rain. Like, so every every year it rains a lot, and I actually live near a hill, and I'm looking up at it, and I'm thinking, oh, maybe that that there'll be a landslide, and then ten years later, and I have dreams every year about landslides, but then uh, ten years later, there's an actual landslide. So I think it would be a mistake to say that those dreams that year that correlate in time to the actual event of a landslide were precognitive. So what I would be interested in knowing about that case is were those people in that village having dreams about disaster all the time? Especially around mines, the most dangerous profession, the most dangerous profession we have is our mines or being a miner. So, uh, uh, so people have concerns, stress that their loved ones are never going to come back. So I would want to know what the baseline dream stress level is on years when nothing bad happens. And then if you see an uptick right before the actual landslide, and that's something the dream net could have done. The dream net could have known what the baseline uh, stress level or the, uh, you know, of, of, of having a disaster happen in that village, what the, the population there, what their baseline stress level was and how it compares to the year before the actual disaster. I'm also reminded of another case uh, involved a train wreck. And um, as I recall, researchers went in and they studied the number of passengers that had been on that particular train the week before and, and the weeks after and the numbers who were on the train the day it uh, crashed. And uh, they found that it was statistically significant. Fewer people were on the train uh, on the day of the crash. So uh, that suggests, again, it may have been uh, unconscious uh, behavior, but uh, it suggests that uh, people were precognizing. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I don't know the case specifically, but what I, what, when, you, when you said the story, what I was thinking is how precognitive dreams can give you a sense of intuition, so you may not be aware of why you feel uncertain about doing something because you've forgotten your dream. So many people probably have had precognitive dreams and many people have dreams that they just don't remember. But it's somewhere in your cells, in your neurons, in your memory. And somehow that can give you an uneasy feeling about uh, a day, a specific day, like certain cues on that day are also in the dream. And those cues trigger a memory that maybe you should stay home that day, for example. Um, that's my best guess about what could be happening. And, and it really shows, even if you don't believe in precognitive dreams, dreams in general do give you some, a sense of intuition and instinct, I think. So I think uh, people, even if they don't believe in precognitive dreams, should pay attention to their dreams. Write them down. Uh, you learn something about yourself, actually, by doing that. And even help plan for your future or, or face the day ahead of you. Well, I... It, very interested in your concept of the oneironauts because it seems to me that in addition to exploring the potential of dreams to look into the future, uh, we could explore the potential of dreams for uh, contacting uh, the deceased. Well, I don't know about that. That uh, I'm not an expert on that. I haven't done that. I haven't had that experience. Um, so... Uh, with precognitive dreams, uh, what I know is that the universe around us, the physical universe, is not intuitive. There is a lot more going on. So I think all these areas are worth exploring because I can't conclude that something is entirely impossible when I'm the one saying that events that haven't happened can be perceived. Events that do not exist can be perceived. Well, I suppose as an astronomer, uh, precognition is a little more palatable than uh, post-mortem survival. Uh, maybe. I don't know. Um, it's certainly – both are fascinating. I'm pretty sure astronomers uh, are worried about their uh, 
their life and death too. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, Paul Callis, this has been a fascinating exploration. I really commend you for your willingness to go public about uh, your interest in precognitive dreaming and, and to show its interrelationship to your own uh, well-acknowledged scientific work. As I recall, you received a very significant award uh, when you were able to photograph uh, Fomalhaut B. Oh yeah, that's right. The um, I want to have a prize for the best paper in science, the journal of science, among all scientific disciplines. It was uh, in 2008 considered one of the breakthrough results uh, in science, not just astronomy and physics. Uh, the Newcomb Cleveland Prize, it's called, uh, and I'm very proud. I, I I can't do this work alone. I really have a long author list, uh, particularly Professor James Graham, uh, who uh, was uh, was with me through the entire experience, and Mark Clampin, who's a NASA scientist at Goddard. So it was a significant discovery that uh, you, you have very clear documentation that you had a, a dream about it a, a decade in advance. Yeah. And the nice thing is, that's my opinion. I wrote my opinion in my book. But I give all the, I give everything a reader, uh, sees that everything that I saw, the reader can see and they can come up to their own conclusions. And that is essentially also scientific. You're, you just publish your work, the data. I have an interpretation for it. And, uh, the reader and science and psychology can, can come up with their own interpretation. Well, it seems to me that you've done an especially good job at looking at the uh, alternative hypotheses and pointing out that uh, an oneironaut who wishes to uh, explore their own precognitive dreaming has to be very astute about all of the other uh, uh, inputs that will affect our dreams. Yeah, I think so. Because after all, our survival depends on anticipating the future. It's just uh, our, our uh, uh, natural selection favors the organisms that are best at responding to new stimuli in the environment. So we're always very even subconsciously paying attention to the future. So for example, when you're driving, that driving is an exercise in predicting the future. Uh, what's that person going to do if something happens over there? And what should I do if that happens? So we're constantly thinking about the future. And uh, so one may say, well, these precognitive dreams are just your mentation about the future. So I think the most, the best examples of precognitive dreams are those where an event is very unpredictable, novel. And because of novelty, uh, my, my theory about precognitive dreams is that they're a natural phenomena that occurs during the biochemistry of learning. When we learn new things, that's when this uh, time travel of information happens, as if to help us prepare to learn the new thing, to prime us for unexpected events. Well, it suggests that uh, we are living in an environment where we're uh, getting signals, information coming not only from the past, which we remember, but from the future that we don't remember. I just gave a talk on the Science of Consciousness uh, conference in Arizona, and I was saying that our consciousness uh, has most, is most, and our identity as people, our identity and consciousness you might think is just based on the present and the past. But this these snippets of information from precognitive dreams means that our future also influences our personality and our consciousness in the present day uh, a little bit because uh, precognitive dreams aren't clear messages about what's going to happen in the future. They aren't long. So when I looked at my 332 precognitive dreams, I would say it's roughly nine seconds of future information of one event. Just nine seconds. Enough to perceive something, but in nine seconds, you don't really perceive the context. You can't think about things too much. It's just nine seconds of 
uh, an experience. And it can be visual, it can be auditory, it can be feelings, it could be touch, it could be smell, uh, whatever we can sense. But the precognitive information is just so short, it's uh, very frustrating. And maybe that's why it's been such an elusive uh, thing to to uh, validate and to come into acceptance. It's a tough project. As I recall from your book, one of the most interesting statistics you cite is with regard to deja vu. Most of those dreams uh, occur like within 24 hours of actually you know, the event itself occurring. Oh, so this was actually a case. The 24-hour thing is when do you realize that you've had a precognitive experience? Uh, so the dreams often, in my case, uh, the dreams happen months to years in the past. The formal hot dream was nine years before the event. Other dreams I've shown to be five years before the event. Other people, apparently, they have can dream about things that will happen the next day. And that sometimes happens with me. Uh, but... So what happens is uh, the event occurs and you may not realize it was a precognitive dream until upon later reflection, as you're going over your memories, you, th you remember, you recall that that strange phrase the boy said about the hay cart uh, was a dream. In my case, that was such an astonishing dream. I remembered it instantaneously. I, I, uh, that's real time deja vu. I call it real time. The event is happening and you're, uh, you remember the dream instantly. For me, other times it's 24 hours later. And, uh, and if it goes too far in the future, you just don't make the connection between the dreams you've had and the events. Well, it may be that uh, we all have unique personalities so that certain time frames uh, we resonate more with. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Uh, I wish I could have dreams about tomorrow more often uh, because then I could establish the proof. Uh, it'll be a little bit easier because when you have a dream that happened five years ago, it's hard to know what that dream really corresponds to five years in the future. And, you know, the famous phrase, uh, 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 reality is stranger than fiction. So the funny thing is about precognitive dreams, especially because they're novel experiences, they really seem like dreams in my case. I can't tell if they're my imagination or reality. In fact, I'm sort of biased towards that they are imagination because where would I ever do, you know, this thing in the future? And it turns out five years later, I do that thing completely unexpectedly. Uh, so th that's the funny thing about precognitive dreams. They, uh, they appear like uh, imaginative events. But in fact, in reality, our life has many things that are surprising and hard to anticipate. I know one of the studies that you cite in your book uh, was done, I think, in the early part of the 20th century by uh, Dunn, I, I think was his name, an experiment with time. This is John Dunn, D-U-N-N-E, um, and he wrote An Experiment with Time. And just like me, he was a person uh, who had training in uh, math and physics and science. He was an aeronautical engineer. So uh, uh, he had sort of a methodical way of, uh, of witnessing these things as maybe an engineer would and trying to construct what uh, he had just seen. And his book is uh, actually one. His book is probably one of the first books I read after, after I had the Haycart dream. Individuals vary a lot, and I've heard uh, people uh, that um, have contacted me, they have uh, m more, much more frequent precognitive experiences than I've had. Um, so, And other people, ha I think, have had it once or twice or three times in their life that they remember. And in fact, there, uh, there have been studies that show the occurrence of deja vu, which is the feeling of having a precognitive experience, uh, decreases with age. So when you uh, ask um, teenagers and college students uh, if they've had precognitive dreams, uh, many report precognitive dreams or precognitive experiences. But then after like 30 years old, it seems to decline with age. 
Uh, but not everyone. I'm an exception, for example. And I've seen other people uh, report that uh, it has not declined with age. They continue to have precognitive experiences. Well, you and I have discussed, and many of our viewers will know because it's in uh, one of my monologues in presence number one for anyone. I'll link to it. As a matter of fact, I had a precognitive dream when I was 26 years old that really ha has set the pattern of my whole career in parapsychology subsequently. I remember that. And I have an example in my book where, uh, the, and it has to do with Fomalhaut, where a precognitive dream can influence your career choice, your you know, the fork in the road that happens after college where you have to decide what are you going to do? Are you going to go this way or that way? And in your case, it was uh, dreaming that you should uh, go to your friend's apartment where you would see a magazine on the floor. That's and right. that was the dream. And lo, you did that. You went and found the magazine and that experience uh, made you want to learn more about the phenomena and you saw it as your yeah. life's choice. And in, in my book, when I talk about Fomalhaut, I talk about a, a fork in the road where uh, as a postdoc, uh, so after graduate school, after getting your doctoral degree, you spend a few years as a postdoc, I could have actually gone to study diplomacy at Georgetown's uh, School of International Relations. I was accepted there to get a master's degree. But I also had a very good position at the Max Planck Institute for Astronomy in Heidelberg, a very prestigious position also. So, and Georgetown is one of the best schools for international relations too. So I had this fork where I couldn't decide what to do. And, uh, and here is, in the book I describe how when you try to make these decisions, you might try to use your brain or do you use your gut instinct? Do you proceed rationally through life and say, well, in this case, for me, uh, 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 a degree from Georgetown actually has a more potential than astronomy. Astronomy, uh, being an academic, has a lot of uncertainties, especially when you're young. You just don't know if you'll make it. Uh, if you have a master's degree, an MBA, the things, uh, there are many doors open for you. So the mind, the brain, the rational side of me said, go to Georgetown. That's a guaranteed career in, uh, in government, nonprofit, industry, you name it. Except years, several years before I had the Fomal hot dream that I had a dream that I would see something that was amazing. This comet belt. So I think in this case, I ended up choosing astronomy, and it's possible that it was the precognitive dream that gave me sort of a gut instinct on what to do, just like with your precognitive experience. It just nurtured something that the brain, the, the rational mind, never could have constructed or thought through. But you, you found it with the precognitive experience. You sort of found your way. Well, it raises many questions about free will and fate, but I uh, am pretty sure that you are like me in, in th this regard, that you have no regrets about the choice you made. No, no regrets at all. I mean, uh, and nobody should really have regrets. I mean, you just have, you have to make a choice and you don't know if the grass is greener anywhere else. Uh, and when you make the choice, the, oh, well, this is the funny thing about precognitive dreams. Precognitive dreams don't give you answers. They give you choices. So you think having a precognitive dream is just going to tell you what to do. It doesn't. It just shows you a choice that's available and you still have to decide. You are the decider. When you opened up the apartment and saw the magazine, you could have decided, well, actually, I don't want that path. I'm going to do something else. So you were, that precognitive dream did, it offered you a choice, an experience. It wasn't any answer that was going to help you. You had to make the decision. Well, Paul Kellis, uh, 
I did make the decision and I, and I'm very grateful for the fact that I did. In my case, I actually think I knew I was going to make that decision somehow in advance. Even before I had the dream, I knew I was about to have an important dream that I would act on. Uh, I want to thank you so much for being with me today. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's been my, my pleasure, actually. And I love hearing about precognitive dreams. Thank you for sharing yours. And uh, I hope people will contact me with their thoughts. I, I'm interested in uh, skeptical approaches, too. Uh, as scientists, uh, we get bombarded with skeptical approaches to just the, the basic science we do, the data, the interpretation. So uh, everything's fair game. I'm excited to hear uh, people's viewpoints, uh, even if they're skeptical. Uh, and uh, what I tell people, if they're interested in this phenomena, is to keep a dream journal. Try to keep a dream journal. Try to raise the sort of the level of your daily consciousness about dreams. Uh, and keeping a journal is one way to do it, because after a while, you'll get better at remembering your dreams because you have a task a goal-oriented task to remember your dreams and you'll start remembering them more and maybe one of those will be precognitive. And when that happens, make sure you document it. Just take a picture of it, write it down. I can guarantee you, if you don't do it right away, you're just going to forget to do it. And you can, there are people who have done this for 30, 40, and 50 years of their lives, keeping these journals. And for those of you watching, thank you for being with us.